I think we can go ahead and get started now. Um, this is a really a, a pleasure to welcome you all today. This is kind of special grand rounds because it's being supported by Cure, um, an epilepsy foundation which really has made a, a huge difference to um, the field of epilepsy. And I just want to spend a minute or two doing two introductions, one to Cure and then second to our speaker uh, who you're sponsoring here today. Uh, and we're being videotaped, so wherever you're sitting, that's where you'll be on the videotape. <laughs> uh, I think what Cure has done, um, back in 1998, I believe, um, so that makes about 15 years, uh, has been remarkable. It's a, a grassroots organization that got together and said, we want to do something really important for epilepsy research by doing what, by actually um, supporting the researchers and the clinicians who are studying this disorder. And as the name implies, trying to make a huge difference, not just in understanding it, but in stopping it. And what they've done over the years is raise at least $20 million, and they get better at this every year. It's so wonderful. Um, and distribute it how in research grants to young investigators, um, travel grants to beginning students in epilepsy, they support meetings, uh, specialized workshops, um, in every way uh, support the infrastructure that makes epilepsy uh, an exciting research field and one where you know, young investigators who are really are going to be the ones who make the difference uh, can thrive. And so what they've done is really just turn the world from black and white to color. Uh, it has really been a change in our culture ever since Cure came on board. and um, Delighted to introduce uh, the founding director, Susan Axelrod, and one of her board members, uh, Bogdan Ewan, who are here today. And you just saw two hands go up, but they're in the room. Along with some of their other supporters who joined us today, and this is really an important day for epilepsy research at the Texas Medical Center. So, today is, I think, the first speaker. They've started another important program of education, which is uh, bringing um, talented uh, epilepsy researchers to Neurology Grand Rounds to talk about epilepsy. Um, and today is the first uh, participant in that exciting program, who is Peter Crino, and I'd like to introduce him. Um, he's a very high-octane speaker, so we picked him to, to start the, the talks off. Um, Peter is a really special guy and a role model for um, MD, PhD clinician scientists in epilepsy. He got his training at Yale University Medical School and um, did his PhD in, at Boston University and then uh, went on to do more advanced training uh, at Penn. Um, and he has advanced from assistant professor to professor and now works at Temple across the street um, in Philadelphia and runs the epilepsy program there. And what he has done and what he's accomplished in epilepsy is really worth pointing out because he's a shy guy and uh, doesn't get the credit he deserves. But what he did um, in 1990s, he had three that I could detect really significant contributions to how we understand the neurobiology of epilepsy. And that is the first one is in his early training, he worked with a fellow named Jim Everwine, who was really the originator of looking at single cells and understanding their molecular contents. And Peter published a very important paper in Neuron in 1996 where he detected messenger RNA at the uh, growth cones and dendrites. And this really changed the way people think about synaptic transmission and how it's regulated in the brain, that actually proteins can be regulated right at the point of contact for a synapse. And really heralded what is now an enormous uh, direction in neuroscience research, which is studying the molecules inside single neurons and understanding them one at a time, as opposed to the old chunk biochemistry that used to be done, where you took a big block of tissue. Now we can do it uh, like Van Loven was looking through the microscope. You can look right at the cells and see what molecules are at these and which ones are perturbed in diseases like epilepsy. The second thing he did that was important was really open the door into something that many of you have heard about, of mTOR signaling cascades. And this is a molecular signaling pathway inside neurons that was being understood in the cancer field. And he really brought it to epilepsy by pointing out that there were differences in 
tuberous sclerosis cells, and these tuber cells, were, which are thought to be a form of cancer, um, uh, and the focal neuronal dysplasia that can be seen commonly in epileptic brain. And he pointed out that there were mTOR signaling differences between these two. And that uh, discovery of that pathway in epilepsy has led to some really important now bench to bedside research in bringing the modulation of this pathway to actually to patients and helping reduce their seizures. So at about the same time, he was also looking at viruses, I guess um, uh, HIV at first, but he was paying attention to viruses in the brain, which none of the rest of us were. And he uh, made some observations just recently now that's led up to this, uh, which is really important, and that is the finding he's going to talk about today of the human papilloma virus and its role in the formation, perhaps, of these focal ectopic dysplasias. And, you know, I really think um, Peter's going to turn out to be the Louis Pasteur of epilepsy <laughs> because this could have enormous public uh, health consequences. And so it's a real pleasure to welcome you here today <coughs> and to give his talk. Thank you. Thanks, Chef. Well, thanks, uh, Jeff. It really is a pleasure to be here, and I thank you for the very kind words. I'm very humbled by it. I, I feel more like maybe Tony Pastor, his brother, or something. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, it's been it's been certainly a, a fun time over the years uh, investigating uh, brain malformations associated with epilepsy. It's got a very significant uh, public health relevance, as I hope you'll see uh, today. Uh, it's really been great to come here. This is my first time in Houston. This is my first time uh, here at this institution. I have a lot of friends here, so Jeff and Ed and. Uh, Anne and Alicia and Susan and uh, our hosts uh, last evening. So uh, really, it's just been a very, a very warm experience, and, and I've had a great time coming here. So uh, thank you very much for having me. It is certainly a privilege for me to kick off this uh, Cure-sponsored speaker series. I will hopefully deliver high octane. If I don't, I'll feel really bad, but I'll, but I'll certainly try my best. Um, so uh, what I'm going to try to talk to you about today is uh, a type of brain malformation that's known as focal cortical dysplasia. Um, and this is some work that started when I was at the University of Pennsylvania and has extended over to now where I am at Temple University um, and at the Shriners, uh, the Shriners Center. And, and as Jeff um, mentioned so kindly, uh, CURE has been uh, really just an absolutely uh, vital part of the initiative in my laboratory. As a matter of fact, they sort of came through for me when I was trying to get funding for a project and was having some difficulties getting funding uh, through the conventional methods. They were the one that saw some wisdom to the science uh, and were able to provide me with some grant funding and really was allowed me to move on to, uh, to R01 funding for this. So I'm, I'm uh, really just eternally uh, grateful to, uh, to Cure and what they do. And they really are an amazing organization as far as marshalling support and resources. Um, so as many of you know, the, the link between viruses and seizures, viruses and epilepsy, is, is not really a new concept. It's been identified before, and I, I won't go through all of this, but certainly we know that viral encephalitis is commonly associated with acute symptomatic seizures, and we know that there is clearly brain injury and sequela from viral encephalitis, so herpes simplex would be the, probably the paradigm for that. Um, and this has been associated with, indeed, a whole bunch of other known viruses that are known to cause brain injury, encephalitis, uh, and seizures. Um, we know that their seizures occur in the setting of acute or a fulminant viral encephalitis. Certainly rabies would be the paradigm. But then there's been other types of association of perhaps more indolent or more long-term associations. One that's come out recently, and Jeff, you know this very well, is an association with human herpes virus 6 or HHV6 and febrile status epilepticus. The link exactly, what the pathogenic mechanism might be, is still, I think, remains to be established. But I think the concept of having a viral infection leading to seizures and epilepsy is, is uh, certainly been around for a bit. Um, one of the areas that I became interested in was what the effects were of congenital or in utero viral infections on brain development. And both for rubella as well as for cytomegalovirus or CMV, it's been demonstrated that infection in utero can clearly alter the assembly and structure of the human brain, with the consequence being that there is the development of, uh, of epilepsy. And really, CMV has been the one over the year, part of sort of the, the torch complex uh, of in utero infections that's been linked to, uh, to brain malformations uh, in, in human patients. Now, I'm going to talk today about a specific type of malformation, which is called focal cortical dysplasia. Focal cortical dysplasia is a 
isolated malformation of the cerebral cortex that we presume happens at some point during corticogenesis, sometime during the time when the cerebral cortex kind of organizes itself and assembles. FCD, as I'll abbreviate, it can be broken down into two types, type 1 and type 2, and these have very unique and uh, sort of distinguishing histopathological features. Um, the belief is that something happens during corticogenesis when cortex assembles that leads to changes in the normal hexalaminar six-layered structure of the neocortex. It leads to alterations in cell morphology, changes in dendrites, cell size, etc. Um, and as a consequence, there is disruption of synaptic connections. This leads uh, inevitably to enhanced incitability and seizure uh, generation. Now, the reason FCD is so interesting, this is not rare. This is something that has been thought to be perhaps one of the most common, if not the most common cause of intractable epilepsy in the pediatric population. Uh, and it was described, there are reports that go back to the early 1900s. It was really described in the literature in the 1970s by Taylor and colleagues. Um, and we know that there is a very high association with medically intractable epilepsy. As a matter of fact, there's really not many cases of someone who just presents with a focal cortical dysplasia as an incidental finding. Usually epilepsy is the presenting complaint. What's interesting is that it's a sporadic disorder. There have been no assembled family pedigrees of patients with uh, focal cortical dysplasia, which whenever I see that, it begins to sort of send you down a pathway of thinking about pathogenesis. Why is it that it's just a sporadic malformation? Why do we not have uh, large family pedigrees that we could use to track down genes? And that, that will come back into my thinking uh, a little bit later. As I mentioned, patients can present really at any time. Usually it's in the pediatric age group, but adults can present with epilepsy and be found to have a dysplasia as well. Any seizure semiology is possible. Typically, malformations are detected by neuroimaging, usually not CT, usually MRI. And with more high-res uh, MRI like 3T, we can now see these uh, malformations much more successfully. Um, there is a high association between the spot on the MRI where the lesion is seen and where the seizures actually propagate from as detected on scalp or intracranial EEG. And if you go in and you try to resect these lesions to affect a cure in epilepsy, about 50 to 70 percent of patients will be uh, treated successfully. But there's still a number of individuals who, uh, even with surgery, are just uh, not effectively treated. So it's still an area of, of great need. Now, just to understand the development a little bit, everything I'm going to talk about today will really relate to the context of corticogenesis. In the human being, uh, the cerebral cortex forms, that's to say it goes from this early ventricular zone, this neuroepithelial layer by which cells migrate, they go under, undergo mitosis, migrate up to form the mature six-layered neocortex. It's believed to span a period of time of approximately 8 to 20 weeks of human gestation. Um, but, you know, the idea that development stops at 20 weeks gestation, as I'm sure you all know, is, is probably not completely correct. There's very good evidence that as the brain develops and as we get even to the newborn period, there's all kinds of changes that occur in synaptic plasticity, pruning, axon development, myelination, etc. And you know, in fact, this probably proceeds on for quite some time. The reason I say that is whenever you talk about a brain malformation, it's important that you don't just conceptualize it as a static event that happens during embryogenesis. Sort of de facto, with all these changes that are going on here, it has to be kind of an ongoing thing. Whatever I'm going to describe to you is sort of happens on the background of ongoing changes in the brain. Indeed, you know, at the time of uh, gestation, you've gone from sort of a neural tube structure to this highly organized uh, cerebral cortex here, but there's still a lot of things that are going on. The brain is still actively wiring itself. And if you look even just an old-fashioned Golgi stain where you look at the time of birth and the cortex to 14 years old, there's tremendous changes that are occurring in the neocortex. Um, so when you talk about a focal malformation of the cortex, you can see that the interplay between the normal processes and whatever the pathogenic mechanisms might be uh, is obviously going to be pretty complex and it's going to take some time for us to figure out. And we know that, you know, early on, age 5 to age 20, and those of you in the crowd who are, who are maybe in your mid-20s, we, we forgive you. You're not fully myelinated. We get that. It's okay. Um, there's still a whole lot of brain development that takes place probably until, our, probably until our 30s. I'm beginning to think that everybody achieves like one day, like on a Thursday, when your brain is great. And then after, after that, everything sort of uh, changes over time. 
Now, focal cortical dysplasia is characterized by some very specific histopathological features, such that if you resect a piece of brain and you look at it under the microscope, you can identify these lesions across populations and across patients. The key features are the following. If this is, for example, the normal lamination pattern of a normal neocortex stained with crescent violet, if you look in a cortical dysplasia specimen, what you will see is that there's alterations in cell polarity. So the apical dendrites of neurons tend to be altered in sort of a, just a somewhat inappropriate way. They should really extend perpendicularly to the peel surface. There are these very, very large dysmorphic neurons. They have an abnormal cell body, an enormous uh, kind of cellular uh, soma, and the processes that come out of them are not the typical cell shapes that you see, for example, in pyramidal cells, and certainly not uh, inner neurons. Um, the key feature of what we're going to talk about today is this type of dysplasia here, which is known as type 2B focal cortical dysplasia. And this type is really characterized by this hallmark cell type, which is known as the balloon cell, or some people refer to it as a giant cell. And it's this very ellipsoid kind of cell with a very dense eosinophilic cytoplasm, a laterally displaced nucleus that can be actually multinucleated sometimes. Um, and they express some interesting markers, so one of which is vimentin, but also nestin and some other sort of curious proteins that probably shouldn't be present in the mature uh, brain. The presence of balloon cells is the defining histopathological feature of focal cortical dysplasia type 2B. So if you have a specimen and you see those cells, you know it's a type 2B dysplasia. Unfortunately, how these various cellular uh, dysmorphisms develop is completely unknown. We don't really know what happens. We don't know how this occurs over time. We don't know why there's such a limited histopathology where you have an island of abnormality surrounded by a relative sea of normal neocortex. So this is what a cortical dysplasia actually looks like. So this is a resected brain specimen from a patient with intractable epilepsy. Here's the neocortex that's normal. And here's this sort of verrucous kind of rough looking area of obviously very abnormal neocortex. Um, what's been shown over the years, and this is some of the work that Jeff alluded to from my lab and several other laboratories, is that if you look histopathologically in these lesions, what you can see is evidence for activation of the uh, pathway known as the mammalian target of rapamycin or mTOR cascade. If you look histopathologically at this marker here, phospho-S6, which is a sort of a two-step downstream substrate from mTOR, what you can see is that this level of constitutive phosphorylation depicted here is really a very successful and very good biomarker for mTOR activation. And virtually every specimen of focal cortical dysplasia type 2B will have evidence of enhanced mTOR signaling as evidenced by this. There's another genetic disease, which is known as tuberous sclerosis, that also relates to abnormal mTOR signaling. And in fact, if you compare tuberous sclerosis to focal cortical dysplasia, it's, it's virtually indistinguishable in terms of the profile of labeling. So this finding back in 2004 was one of the first things that put my lab on the pathway that cortical dysplasia type 2B may in fact be related to <coughs> abnormal mTOR signaling, and that mTOR may be a pathogenic pathway. And so the idea that we've come up with, and I, I, put, I wrote this here and then I looked at it and I said, boy, that's certainly self-promotion. I did not mean that. But we, we just had, we've written several review papers about this that, that what we believe to happen is that, you know, during brain development, what we think probably happens is that there is a, some type of molecular event, and mostly we've been thinking somatic mutation, some kind of molecular event that leads to an alteration of mTOR signaling. And as a consequence, there is gross disorganization of the neocortex compared to cortex here. Um, as a consequence, clinically, you may have epilepsy, varying degrees of cognitive disability, and actually even some autism like, uh, autistic like spectrum have been associated with cortical dysplasia. This can be a tiny lesion the size of my pinky nail, it can be the size of my thumb, but in some cases they're actually much larger and actually can extend to a hemispheric dysplasia. One of the examples might be hemimegalencephaly, for example, where an entire hemisphere is dysmorphic and abnormal. Now, the mTOR signaling cascade, this is actually a very basic version of this uh, cascade. It's a very complicated cascade. There's a lot of players. But the key lesson I want you to take from this is that here's mTOR right here. mTOR actually has two forms, mTOR1 and mTOR2. We're going to focus on mTOR1 today. mTOR1 is directly regulated upstream by these two G proteins right here, TSC1 and TSC2. They're the proteins that are encoded by uh, the genes responsible for tuberous sclerosis complex. What's believed to happen is that in response to a variety of different canonical signaling inputs, so growth factors, uh, levels of energy in the cell, ambient levels of O2, ambient levels of amino acids, that this complex is either relatively on or relatively off. And as I said, when it's relatively on, what you see is exuberant phosphorylation of the S6 protein. Um, 
What we believe is that many of these focal malformations in which we see abnormal mTOR signaling can be sort of inserted or fitted in, uh, fit into this uh, mTOR signaling cascade, usually as a consequence of either loss of function mutations in inhibitors or gain of function mutations in activators of this uh, cascade. This drug right here is obviously very important. Uh, several of you in the audience, John Swan and, uh, and uh, Ann, can, and can also comment on rapamycin. They've used these drugs in the lab and clinically. Uh, rapamycin is, is a, a potent uh, mTOR inhibitor, which actually has been shown in several epilepsy models, both in mouse models and, and in patients, to interfere with uh, seizure propagation and initiation. So clearly, the pathway is closely linked to seizures and epileptogenesis. And why is that? Well, we know that there's a lot of functions that uh, mTOR signaling subserves just in the normal nervous system. So the establishment of long-term potentiation, synaptic plasticity, protein synthesis, stem cell regulation. So it's, a, it's obviously a very powerful cascade that relates to a lot of functions in the, uh, in the nervous system, both during development and in the adult nervous system. Now, we believe the idea is that somatic mutations, mutation that occurs during brain development in a mitotic or dividing progenitor cell could lead to some of these. And there's been some recent precedent from that. So for example, some work in my lab in tuberous sclerosis a few years ago showed that, you know, you can look and you can find a germline mutation in the patient. And if you actually go into the brain and you do laser capture microdissection of cells that are phospho S6 positive, so cells that actually have activation of mTOR, you can demonstrate somatic second hit mutations that occur just in these individual cells. So conceptually, the idea for a somatic mutation is well served in the brain. It makes, it makes reasonably, uh, reasonably good sense. In fact, over the years, we've assembled a group of disorders that we've called mTORopathies, disorders of mTOR signaling, um, one of which is tuberous sclerosis, which is an autosomal dominant form. Another disorder is called pretzel syndrome, which we've described, which is among the Amish community. It's a recessive disorder. Um, and then there's been some interesting developments recently in hemimegalencephaly, where there's been somatic mutations in PI3K, AKT3, and mTOR. So AKT3 is right here, uh, PI3K is upstream, so all involving this, this mTOR cascade, suggesting that there's an entire family of disorders characterized by altered lamination, the presence of enlarged balloon cells or cytomegaly, and clinically in association with intractable uh, epilepsy. Ganglioglioma is a very interesting tumor-like dysplasia in the brain, which has been associated with mutations in LKB1, which is right here, as well as BRAF, which is right here, which also regulates mTOR signaling. So conceptually, this this idea of somatic mutations has made sense for at least a handful of these mTORopathies. But focal cortical dysplasia remains really quite vexing. I've been working on this for probably 17 years of my career. We've done all kinds of gene expression analysis. We've done some gene mutational analysis. And we just have come up empty handed. We just haven't really come up with anything as of yet uh, as far as uh, good candidate genes. We'll come back to that though later, later in the talk. So the model we've always espoused has been that these malformations occur by a somatic mutation that occurs in a progenitor cell. The progenitor cell undergoes division, migrates up into the cortex. These cells that are red, they actually contain the mutation and therefore they turn on mTOR signaling. And therefore their migration is just not completely normal. They form this lesion right here, which we see depicted right here. And it's really essentially a mosaic of normal cells and these cells depicted in red, which contain a somatic, uh, somatic mutation. And this really has been the model that we have maintained for a long time. Here's this island of abnormality here, surrounded by this relative sea of normal neocortex. And that's been the working model. Um, but things have changed a little bit, and uh, hopefully I can explain that to you. A work that we, paper that we published in 2003 tried to get at the idea of clonality, the hypothesis being that if this is really a somatic mutation, there shouldn't be 10 somatic mutations, right? There should be one somatic mutation, and there should be kind of a clonal expansion of the lesion over time. Therefore, the lesion should be, in effect, clonal. Well, we actually did a clonality assay where we took advantage of this poly-CAG repeat that's present on the X androgen receptor. And as you know, in female uh, cells, there's two X chromosomes. One of those X chromosomes is inactivated by X inactivation. Well, there are some genes that have sequence polymorphisms in them, one of them which is the X androgen receptor. And there's different sizes of these CAG repeats. So for example, here's a uh, female patient set of cells uh, where one of the repeats is 17, one of them is 23. This is a male patient who only has one X chromosome and therefore only has one repeat. Here's another female patient. The postulate would have been that if we went to each one of these cells, they should all have the same length repeat because they should be all 
uh, clonally derived. Unfortunately, when we actually did this experiment, this isn't actually true. So here's one, two, three, four, five micro dissected cells where we actually sequenced through this repeat and we counted how many repeats there were. And cells that look reasonably similar, one and two, have different size repeats, meaning they, meaning they can't be clonally derived. Other cells that looked very different, like two and like one and three, looked very similar at the molecular level. So this started us thinking that, hmm, maybe this idea of a somatic mutation and a clonal expansion, perhaps not, that's not the best model. And there has to be sort of another way to explain a sporadic malformation that's not necessarily clonally expansive that gives you a uniform histopathology. The other thing is that cortical dysplasias often express um, very strange proteins. And these proteins in particular are stem cell markers here. So SOX2, OCT4, CBIC, KLF4. Most of these proteins are seen in neuroprogenitor cells, neuroglial progenitor cells, and never seen in the mature brain, or rarely. But if you look right here, this is a whole population of uh, cells in type 2 cortical dysplasias. And they all show activated mTOR signaling. And this is just cell counts of the number of cells that are SOX2 or OCT4 or CMYC positive. So almost all of these cells express stem cell markers, suggesting they either have failed to fully differentiate or they have some kind of ongoing process which is essentially fostering this maintenance of a stem cell phenotype. That's correct. Yeah, that's basically cell counts of balloon cells. Yep. So the defining features of focal cortical dysplasia type 2B would be, number one, a sporadic incidence with no family pedigrees, a consistent cytopathic effect with balloon cells, evidence of enhanced mTOR signaling, some previous studies that have shown enhanced PI3K and AKT signaling, a recent study that demonstrated reduced levels of TSC2, one of the upstream regulators of mTOR, and this persistent expression of stem cell markers. So how do we account for all of that? Well, if we go back to this diagram of mTOR signaling, we look at malformations like hemimegalencephaly or tuberous sclerosis or pretzel syndrome or ganglioglioma. We've identified mutations that we can insert into this mTOR signaling cascade. But focal cortical dysplasia type 2B just doesn't seem to fit anywhere. We can't find one particular thing that would answer all the requirements needed for FCD. A couple of years ago, I was trolling through the literature and I found a very interesting paper, which was that one of the binding partners for TSC2, one of the regulators for mTORC, was actually the E6 oncoprotein that's present in human papillomavirus. A subsequent study by Spangle and Munger demonstrated that the HPV16 E6 oncoprotein, which is basically a sort of a very pro-oncogenic protein expressed in human papillomavirus, is a potent activator of mTOR signaling and fosters enhanced protein synthesis. This is what the virus looks like. And as most of you, I'm sure, know, human papillomavirus is highly associated with cervical dysplasia and cancer. In fact, 95% plus cases of cervical dysplasia are associated with uh, HPV. There's actually four types that are associated. There's uh, HPV 6, 11, 16, and 18 have all been associated. Um, and as you all know, since the advent of the uh, two vaccines that we have, Gardasil being one of them, there has been a change in the public health uh, epidemiology of HPV infection. But until recently, the number of cases was really dramatically on the rise. Indeed, if you look in places like Latin America and Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, uh, the incidence is really rising very rapidly. Now, the E6 oncoprotein seems to be pivotal in this. And the E6 oncoprotein does a lot of important and very bad things, one of which is to inactivate P53, a critical regulator of cell cycle. But it also seems to activate mTOR via signaling at IGF, insulin-like growth factor, the epidermal growth factor receptor, PI3K, mTOR, and amazingly, it binds to this protein right here, which is known as E6AP, many of you which, which you know of as UBE3 ligase, the same thing that's uh, Angelman syndrome, so it's the same, same protein. And what it does is it targets protein for ubiquitin-mediated proteosomal degradation, one of which is actually TSC2. So one of the functions of E6 is to come into cells and target cells for degradation. And so this is E6AP, the protein that's encoded by UBE3A. As you know, this, this gene and protein is highly associated with Angelman syndrome, which is also a very uh, aggressive uh, genetic epilepsy syndrome. And UBE3 and e E6AP are highly developmentally expressed in the mouse as early as E8 to E10. So clearly there is this substrate that's present in cells that's available to bind directly uh, to E6. 
The general schema is that E6 and E7 as part of the viral genome in HPV come into the cell, they enter into the nucleus, they either remain as episomal DNA or they can intercalate into the chromosomal DNA. Proteins are translated and exported out into the nucleus and then they do bad things, one of which is to turn on the mTOR signaling cascade. So actually, E6 fulfills many of the cellular requirements of what we want for something like uh, focal cortical dysplasia. It seems to activate growth factors that turn on mTOR. It seems to directly activate mTOR. It inactivates TSC2, thereby turning on mTOR. And it actually seems to facilitate the expression of a variety of different stem cell proteins. So I found that to be very compelling at the cellular and the molecular uh, level. This is a model of how cervical dysplasia occurs. And what's believed to happen is that Here's the normal cervical epithelium. The virus comes in and it infects a population of progenitor cells along the basement membrane. This is the viral genome right here. There's several important proteins. Here's E6, E7. There's a variety of other proteins here. The virus gets in and slowly begins to replicate within this small little island of abnormal histology. The virus replicates, these cells change, and at some point in time there is a transition to a highly dysplastic, or in some cases a frankly neoplastic cellular phenotype. So in effect what you have in cervical dysplasia is you have an island of abnormality surrounded by a relative sea of normal cervical epithelium. Um, and so I thought that just the pathobiology of cervical dysplasia was very reminiscent of what's seen in focal cortical dysplasia. Perhaps most compelling, though, was the fact that if you look in histopathological sections, the characteristic cellular phenotype in cervical dysplasia is a cell that's known as a coilocyte. Coilocytes are characterized by a laterally displaced nucleus, an eosinophilic cytoplasm, and they're also called balloon cells. So I thought that was fairly compelling. At some point in time, you have to say, wow, that's really compelling. <laughs> you have to do something about it. Um, so we did some further digging and we found that there's a lot of interesting similarities between the marker proteins that are expressed in cervical dysplasia and the marker proteins that are expressed in cortical dysplasia. So a very nice paper from um, the UK group with uh, Mar uh, Maria Tom and uh, Brian Harding and Sanjay Sisodia looked at the presence of this marker here, MCM2, in focal cortical dysplasia. This is a marker of G1 to S phase transition in cells. It's a marker of active stem cell-like uh, movement. And it turns out that focal cortical dysplasia robustly express MCM2. This is long before anyone thought about HPV. If you look in the HPV literature, there's very clear evidence that MCM2 can be used as a diagnostic biomarker for cervical dysplasia. So a lot of commercial kids actually assay for uh, MCM2 as a way to look for dysplasia within the uh, cervical epithelium. The other thing is that if you take E6 and E7 and you transfect in those plasmids into uh, stem cells, what you can do is you can drive um, the uh, number of self-renewing neural progenitor cells in that population in vitro. So you can actually drive a stem cell phenotype and even a neural stem cell phenotype, which I thought was very reminiscent of the stem cell marker proteins that we've seen expressed in focal cortical dysplasia. So the similarities between cervical dysplasia and focal cortical dysplasias really are cytopathology with an enlarged cell size, cell signaling with enhanced PI3K and mTOR, the presence of mTOR uh, downstream uh, cascades like phospho-OS6, and the presence of a stem cell phenotype. So that led us to the idea that, hmm, cervical dysplasia sounds an awful lot like cortical dysplasia, sporadic incidence, enhanced mTOR signaling, consistent cytopathic effect, and a virtual 100% of the cases are associated with an HPV infection. However, HPV has never been described in the human brain before, and in actually usually HPV studies, the brain is used as a negative control. Well, we check the brain, it's not there, well, okay, we know that there's no HPV. But nonetheless, we hypothesize, we ask the question, could E6 be present and detected in balloon cells. So we scoured the literature to look for any kind of precedent for this, and we only really found two studies. The first study was a paper by Fool and colleagues which showed that in peripheral nerves that are located directly adjacent to oral pharyngeal cancer, and as many of you know, uh, that uh, oral pharyngeal cancer is also highly associated with HPV infection. If you look in these peripheral nerves, you can detect E6. Here's E6 in green, and this is just an axonal protein marker. Here's in situ hybridization and the axons. Here's a negative control. So you can easily detect it in a neural structure. This isn't the brain. It's a peripheral nerve, but it's still a neural structure. 
I'm sorry? This is an E6 antibody, yes, an anti-E6 antibody. It's just, this is just double immunofluorescence with an overlay there. Yep. And this is PCR of E6 from the, from the peripheral nerve itself. This is actually RT-PCR. Uh, the other interesting thing was that Arbeit and colleagues made a transgenic mouse in 1993 where they inserted E6 and E7 into the mouse expecting to get a phenotype of gynecological malignancies. Unfortunately, the mouse had no gynecological phenotype and the mice died of highly anaplastic brain tumors. So very unsuspected, and I actually talked to Arbite on the phone, and I said, so what did you guys do with that mouse? And he said, well, we did nothing with it. It, it totally didn't help us at all. Uh, so, and that was a lost resource, actually. The mouse is not available anymore, which I was like, ah, son of a gun. Um, so anyway, so there at least is a little bit of precedent for this, pop, for this uh, possibility. So what we did was we in, uh, sort of uh, embarked on a long process of discovery to try to investigate the presence of E6 and other uh, HPV elements in uh, focal dysplasia. So the first thing we did was we did some standard uh, Western analysis with a panoply of different antibodies. Um, and here is HPV E6 using this antibody here, AB70, in HeLa cells. As you know, if any of you read Rebecca Skloot's book, um, HeLa cells are immortalized because of the presence of HPV 18. And so here's HPV E6. The E6 protein is present both in HPV 16 and in 18. Um, here it is in Caskey cells, which is a cervical cancer cell line, also contains HPV 16. Um, here it is in focal cortical dysplasia type 1A. It's not detected. And here it is in uh, normal control brain. Everybody asks me, did we do this in focal cortical dysplasia type 2B? And we did, except the Western looks really, really messy and icky. And I just don't have a picture here to, to show you, but it is positive there. Um, we then looked by immunocytochemistry in Caskey cells and in HeLa cells. The protein is clearly detected by immunocytochemistry. We then looked in a variety of different other cell lines, so fibroblasts, lymphocytes from control patients, patients with tuberous sclerosis. We did not find it there. We looked in glioma cells, so this is a U87 and the U87 V3 variant. This has the EGFR mutation in it. We did not find uh, the protein in those cells by, by Western either. We recently did a dot blot validation assay to try to test what the specificity was of this antibody. And essentially what we have here is a series of uh, E6 purified protein that's been laid down on nitrogen membrane. And we basically do varying dilutions of the E6 peptide with the antibody. And you can see there's a very nice sort of dil dose response dilution effect, suggesting that the AB70 E6 antibody does in fact recognize E6 very nicely uh, in a very uh, titratable uh, fashion. So this is the paper that we published just uh, in December of 2012. Uh, this was worked on by a graduate student in my lab, uh, Julie Chen. And what you see here are six independent specimens of resected focal cortical dysplasia. So these are patients with intractable epilepsy who underwent epilepsy surgery. These are focal cortical dysplasia type 2B specimens. And they are probed with the an uh, antibody against E6, the AB70. And what you can see is a very characteristic and interesting profile of labeling, which is largely cytoplasmic but also nuclear in some of the cells. Uh, in these large balloon-looking cells scattered throughout the dysplasia. Now, I think this is a nice image here because what you have is in this dysplasia, here's the peel surface. Above it, there is no dysplasia, but the dysplasia is kind of subcortical. It doesn't seem to be just cross-reacting non-specifically with uh, other cells that are present uh, in, uh, outside the dysplasia. It seems to be pretty specific for the dysplasia. And again, just to remind you, here's, here's the viral genome for HPV, here's E6, and here's E7. Um, here is uh, white matter, which was negative, and here it is in cortex, which was also negative. Um, just so you know, this is what it looks like in cervical dysplasia, in the cervical epithelium. This is E6, and you can see there's a profile of both cytoplasmic and variably nuclear labeling as well. These are six different specimens that we procured um, and uh, that, we, uh, that we looked at. So in our series that we published, we looked at 50 cases of focal cortical dysplasia type 2B. We uh, were able to obtain these from a variety of different collaborators. Our biggest collaborator is Eleonora Ronica in the Netherlands, who has a very large uh, series of, of cases that she sent to us. And then we looked at 31 control specimens, really lots of different types, ganglioglioma, control, temporal lobe epilepsy, other types of dysplasia. And we had a virtual, uh, essentially, complete uh, detection of E6 in 100% of the uh, cases of FCD2B. And it was not detected in any of the control cases. And we went through this very, very dogmatically, case by case by case. In fact, when Eleonora did the first immunohistochemistry for us, I actually sent her the antibody and didn't tell her what the antibody was. I just sent her the antibody. I said, this is a mouse monoclonal. Can you stain some sections? Tell me what you see. 
she sent me back an email and she said, all the balloon cells are positive. What's the, what is the antibody? I said, it's E6 human papillomavirus. And I wish I saved the email. It's just dot, 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 question mark. <laughs> so so she, even she was a little, uh, little curious about that. This is what some of the control tissue looks like, just so you actually can see it with your own eyes. There really is just, there's just no background staining. If you do no primary antibody like A and B, it's clearly not just some DAB artifact. If you do an isotype, uh, sort of a general isotype IgG antibody in C and D, it doesn't seem to be nonspecific secondary uh, reaction either. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that the staining is, is actually recognizing E6. We've gone on to do two sets of tissue microarrays, 26 each. This is 52 cases. Um, we haven't published this yet, but in none of these little, tiny little tissue dots have we detected the E6 uh, oncoprotein. These are all control uh, specimens. Uh, so each one of these is an individual specimen of cortex from a different uh, patient. You, if any of you use tissue micro, it's a great, great technology to look at lots and lots of samples uh, rapidly and get at least a first pass look at protein expression. Um, we did some in situ hybridization. This is a specimen of cervical cancer, and you can see there's these brown uh, reaction product from a biotinylated um, uh, probe shows the location of the, uh, of the E6 oncoprotein. Um, these are in vitro. These are Caskey cells. This is a cervical cancer cell line, which uh, expresses HPV 16E6, and we did in situ hybridization, and you can see there's the sort of very punctate kind of brown reaction product that's present here, suggesting that our probe was a valid probe for E6. And then we went in and we did uh, both in situ hybridization as well as PCR. So this is DNA PCR. This is the cervical cancer cell line. This is a no DNA control. And this is a very unique cervical cancer cell line that does not have HPV. It's the only cervical line that does not have HPV, and it's negative. Here you can see it in the four FCD cases and in none of the controls. We also looked at E7, which is the adjacent protein to E6, and we looked at the LCR, which is the upstream uh, translational regulatory element for E6, and that was also detectable. This is immuno, I'm sorry, this is in situ hybridization. This is control. There's no hybridization in the controls, uh, and this is what the cellular labeling looks like. So we were able to corroborate it uh, at the nucleic acid level as well. The next question was, if we believe that cortical dysplasia is indeed an mTORopathy, and if we're presuming some kind of association between E6 and mTOR signaling, we should see a fairly close overlay between the two uh, profiles. So again, just to remind you, this is phospho S6, and this is the kinase that phosphorylates S6 downstream of mTOR. Type 2 dysplasias robustly activate or show activated mTOR signaling. If you look at uh, E6 in green and phospho S6 in red, what you can see is there's a virtual 100% overlay between the E6 positive cells and the cells in which there is activation of mTOR signaling. Every now and again, there was one of these little green guys down here that was E6 positive and not mTOR uh, activated. I don't, I don't know what the significance of that is just yet, but we're, we're still working on it. We've done a replication study where we've taken cells that are E6 uh, immunoreactive. So this is a focal cortical dysplasia 2B specimen that's E6 immunoreactive. We very simply extract genomic DNA. We made some E6 specific primers, and we basically just do standard PCR. And here's one, two, three, four, five FCD samples where we can detect E6. This is a control, which is the kit. This is a water control. And then these are a series of control samples. And controls are post-mortem controls, no history of epilepsy, no dysplasia, and none of them are, are positive. Um, to our great relief, uh, in uh, 2013, Lou and colleagues published a paper in the Annals of Neurology replicating these findings. And so what they did was they looked at FCD2A and FCD2B specimens. So I'll focus on the 2B first. They looked at a cohort of 20 FCD2B specimens, and they were able to detect HPV 16E6 in 18 out of those 20 cases. I, I don't know why they didn't find it in the other two, but if you look at the cervical cancer literature, it's, again, it's almost 100%. Every now and again, there's a case that you can't detect it. Um, here's HPV 16, and you can see it present in the balloon cells. So here's an overlay with new N, and here's the merge. They did PCR through the uh, region of E6, and here you can see this amplicon that's about 150 base pairs. That is E6. What was interesting about this report, though, is that they also looked at FCD2A. And what they found here, and we had not really looked at any other virus, so we'd only looked at HPV16. They looked at CMV, HHV6, and HSV1, and they were able to detect CMV, HHV6, and HSV in a varying combination. Now, the cohort wasn't that large. I think it was only like 30 specimens, and so there was variable detection of these different <coughs> antibodies and these different, of these different proteins and different uh, genes. 
Um, and they had about six cases where they detected like CMV plus HSV or CMV plus HHV. Frankly, I don't know what to make of that. It doesn't really have the link into the balloon cell phenotype, although I will tell you that both CMV and HHV have been linked to mTOR signaling, so it's possible that, that this is meaningful, and obviously much more needs to be done to try, to try to figure this out. But I was at least very comforted by the fact that they were able to replicate this finding in a, in a fairly robust fashion. <laughs> The other thing that was, interested, was that, interesting was that Lou and colleagues also looked at some of the downstream signaling of viral infections. And there's two particular proteins that are very important. One's called toll-like receptor 3, or TLR3, and the other is TRIF, which is a downstream signaling molecule from, from uh, TOL3. Um, TOL3 are important receptors that are expressed on neurons, often in response, actually a variety of different cells, in response to an inflammatory uh, stimulus. TOL3 is only expressed in the setting of a viral infection. And so normally TOL3 is not expressed in the nervous system. It's not expressed really in any other situation unless there is an ongoing viral infection or the detective, detection of viral nucleic acid in a cell. TRIF is also turned uh, on in terms of its signaling when toll-like receptor 3 is activated. And so if you look here, here's FCD2B. You can see TLR3 expressed in these balloon cells. And here's FCD2B. You can see this large balloon cell here expressing TRIF. So that was also some nice downstream signaling evidence that a viral infection may have actually taken place inside the cells. To test this experimentally, we did a technique called in utero electroporation, where we basically take a plasmid DNA, we inject it into the brain of an E14 embryonic uh, mouse, so basically the uteri are externalized from the pregnant dam. We do a microinjection into the fetal brain, then we do a trans, uh, basically a transcranial electrical stimulation, a pulse is passed across the brain, allowing electroporation of your plasmid into progenitor cells. We then let the animal survive to varying time points, in this case we did E19 and P6, animals are euthanized and then we look at them under the microscope. And what we found was, here's a construct, if you put in this construct on embryonic day 14, because of lineage dating in the nervous system, all of those cells migrate to layer 2 and 3. So any cell that's not in 2, 3 is doing something it's not supposed to be doing. So here's a red fluorescent protein, RFP alone transfection, and you can see the cells are right up here in layer 2, 3 where they're supposed to be. If you do an E6, E7 transfection, so this is both E6 and E7 right here, with RFP, the cells fail to migrate up to layer 2, 3, and they're stuck down here in the subcortical regions. Again, suggesting a model for alteration or disruption of normal cortical lamination and uh, structure. Recent collaborations with Sonny Kim at the Shriners Hospital where I am has done an E6 only transfection. And interestingly, the effect is less pronounced with E6 alone, suggesting that just as in cervical dysplasia, you really do need both genes, both proteins expressed, E6 and E7, for the full phenotype. There's still a disruption in cells that are stuck down here in the subcortical region. Um, but they do ultimately migrate up at P6. They're just very, very bizarre looking. And actually, we've done some cell size measurements. They seem to be larger. And they have very, very few processes, very few dendrites and axons coming out of them. So the next experiment we're obviously going to do is a repeat E6 and E7 and try to track this out and really look and do some confocal and actually measure what we're seeing in the cell, cell body. So the simple question is, based on what I've shown you, could human papillomavirus actually even infect the brain? As I said, there's no precedent for this. No one's ever demonstrated this. I'm not even sure it's actually possible. Well, if you troll the literature a little bit, you'd have to think that cortical dysplasia as a developmental lesion, we're also kind of stuck in the mindset that this has to happen in utero. Well, well, maybe it does, but, but maybe it doesn't, right? There's no evidence that focal cortical dysplasia can't arise later in uh, neonatal life or postnatal or even into adult life. It's certainly possible. Um, as I mentioned, the brain has been the control for most human papillomavirus studies. It's usually negative. So there's no place in the literature I can go and say, oh, at least they showed you can put HPV into the, into the brain. There's really no evidence for this, so we have to show this. HPV binds typically to the basement membrane and to progenitor epithelial cells that are along the basement membrane. The viral co-receptor, the surface receptor that allows the virus to bind and internalize into the cell, is a group of interesting molecules known as heparin sulfate proteoglycans, or HSPGs. Turns out that if you look in the developing brain, the place with the highest expression of HSPGs is right here in the ventricular zone, so the spot where all those early progenitor cells are waiting to potentially be infected and give rise to, to the dysplasia. So at least conceptually, it's possible for the virus to bind. 
In order to test this hypothesis, we've embarked on a very complicated set of experiments that we're still working on, which is the generation of HPV pseudovirions. So these are not the actual viruses. They're synthetically generated pseudoviruses that still nonetheless bind to cells and, and infect the cell. HPV itself is a very, very difficult virus to isolate. And none of the studies in cervical disease use actual virus. They use these pseudovirions to infect cells. Essentially, you package a E6, E7 with an L1, L2, which is the capsid protein. You put them together in culture in a particular type of cell, 293 TT cells. And the viruses, basically, these little pseudovirions, they kind of self-package. You ultracentrifuge and you isolate these cells. So what you basically have is the viral capsid protein surrounding either E6 plus GFP, GFP alone, or some other thing that you want to put inside human papillomavirus. So we did the infection in 293 FT cells. So this is GFP plus E6 showing that we can infect epithelial cells. This is just an RFP construct within it, suggesting that we can, again, with another fluorochrome, we can detect this. Um, if we did immunocytochemistry, sorry, if we did in situ hybridization to look for E6, so this is fluorescence expression of the protein, and this is detection of the message. We can detect the message in these cells. Um, and this is the first bit of preliminary data we have. So this is GFP E6, and this is just an RFP protein going into mouse neuroprogenitor cells. So at least on the basis of pilot data we have, it seems as though uh, HPV can infect neuroprogenitor cells, and there's a way of getting that, that virus in. If we can confirm that, that'll be a big, big uh, finding. So what are the interpretations of the data I've shown to you? Well, I think there's really three. Number one. HPV is present in the brain, but it's not pathogenic. That's the least exciting possibility. But look, we've just stumbled onto something. It's true, true, and unrelated. It's not pathogenic in any way, and who cares? Well, if that's true, OK, so A, who cares? But what I would say is we still have a very interesting set of proteins to look at, E6 and E7, during cortical development. They clearly activate mTOR. And so I'm thinking that even if this is not really a pathogenic, oops, sorry about that, not a pathogenic process, this might be able to provide a very novel mouse model for focal cortical dysplasia. You can inject these genes. You can focally turn them on. You can activate mTOR in a very focal and re restricted spot. Um, and it would be a wonderful model to look at focal cortical dysplasia. You can titrate to effect to make little teeny dysplasias, or you could do a big bomb and make an enormous hemispheric dysplasia. Of course, what we'd want to do is we'd want to do an assay for seizures to see if these malformations actually cause electrically active seizures. Clearly, there's a role for looking at E6AB and UPE3 ligase. This is a very, very important uh, gene and protein. There's a clear link to epilepsy and Angelman syndrome. So even if it turns out that HPV is not actually pathogenic, I still think the line of investigation is, is credible and worthwhile. The second hypothesis, and I wrote this in a recent response uh, to an article in Annals of Neurology, is that, in fact, there really is an infection. It's an intrauterine infection. The vertical transmission rate of human papillomavirus in pregnant females is 12%, so it's not trivial. It's very real. I guess it's possible that there's a postnatal infection, and I guess there's, it's possible that there could be an adult infection, right? So HPVs are found in the oropharynx and the nasopharynx of every single person. So who knows? Maybe there's another way to think about it. But let's think about this still as a developmental malformation. This postulate would be that HPV provides a uniform pathogenic association, and in fact, it is the cause of focal cortical dysplasia. Well, that would be very, very important and very unique. We'd have to go and look for other HPV isotypes, such as 6, 11, and 18, and we'd have to look for the presence of certain SNPs and mutations that are present in various ethnic groups that are present in certain populations that have larger dysplasias, let's say in cervical cancer, um, and see if that relates to the size of the dysplasia. And then, as suggested by Lou and colleagues, perhaps look at other viruses like CMV and HHV6 and, and, uh, and other viruses like that. So I think this is one very exciting possibility. That would follow this model, that there is a transplacental infection, that you have multiple cells that are infected. If you remember that clonality assay I showed you a little while ago, that would explain the non-clonality of these lesions. It would explain why all these cells are infected. All the red cells contain HPV, E6, E7, and they're the things that are actually forming this island of abnormal cortex. Very similar to what we see in cervical cancer and cervical dysplasia, giving you this isolated focal malformation. The last possibility is the one that I think is the most exciting, and I think it's the one that fits most realistically with the epidemiology of cervical cancer, cervical dysplasia, and likely with other brain malformations. And this is, this is very relevant, I think, clinically. That FCD and HPV are linked together, and then there is, in fact, an intrauterine infection. 
And there is, in fact, a pathogenic association. But what's been suggested for cervical dysplasia is that it is not a uniform pathogenesis, is that it's a combinatorial pathogenesis. And by that, I mean the presence of, HP, of HPV in focal cortical dysplasia leads to a mutational transactivation by virtue of chromosome instability. So the presence of E6 and E7 in cells basically joggles the stability of the genome and makes cells more uh, sensitive or susceptible to somatic mutations. And Ingmar Bloomke showed this very nicely in, 2000 in, a, in 2008, looking at, my, at chromosome instability in, in cortical dysplasia and actually demonstrated that, yeah, it sure looks as though there is, uh, generally speaking, a greater instability within uh, cortical dysplasia lesions and that the effect of this would be the induction of somatic mutations. And this model has absolutely been proposed in cervical cancer, and in fact, it's actually been demonstrated in cervical cancer. So if you look, this is a paper just published in Cancer a little while ago at a cohort of female patients with cervical cancer. Every one of these female patients has a human papillomavirus infection, every one of them. But on top of that, 60% of them have mutations in a variety of very, very compelling genes. So in this case, PI3 kinase. KRAS, EGFR. What will really bake your noodle, and certainly bake my noodle, was if you look at some of these mutations. So here's this mutation here. You have this lysine transversion and this glutamine transversion right here. If you look at this mutation, and then you go to the data that we know for hemimegalencephaly, another sort of large kind of hemispheric focal brain malformation, they're the exact same mutations, exact same mutations. So again, just to bring it home, this is cervical cancer. This is hemimegalencephaly. So the idea would be that you have this infection with a somatic mutation together. You have a viral infection and a somatic mutation that occurs. This is either going to be a single progenitor or multiple genitors, and I would favor this model, that it's multiple, a single mutation and then multiple infections. And then over time, you may accumulate mutations. You may assemble and put together worsening uh, mutational status. And that's ultimately how you lead to this uh, mosaic lesion right here, which has got infected and mutated cells compared to the surrounding cells depicted in blue that are all completely normal. Now, the clinical implications of this, I think, if the data is sound, and in fact this is a pathogenic association, would be the following. Number one, obviously you'd be able to develop a diagnostic bioassay for HPV in patients with epilepsy, specifically patients with focal cortical dysplasia. That could be in blood or in resected tissue. I think it would allow us, like in cancer, to look at prognosis and stratification. So does the presence or absence of HPV confer a different outcome? There are certain mutations in HPV genes that confer differential outcomes in terms of cervical cancer. Maybe that's referable to the lesion size or intractability of someone's seizures. This would allow us to have potentially a prenatal test where you're uniformly looking for the presence of uh, HPV in pregnant females. The fact that this is linked to mTOR signaling would certainly make you think that using mTOR inhibitors such as rapamycin would be a very credible strategy in these patients. In fact, mTOR inhibitors have been used now to treat cervical cancer, so there's conceptual and real-time backup for that. There are some HPV small molecule compounds that are being marketed now to actually specifically address and specifically attack HPV infection itself, which would be very, very exciting. And then obviously, I don't want to overstate this, but you know, if in fact the epidemiological data is true that Gardasil is actually, and I'm not endorsing Gardasil, it just happens to be one of the vaccines, but that Gardasil is actually altering the epidemiology of cervical dysplasia in uh, men and women, you know, in theory, somebody asked me this question last night, you know, am I suggesting that potentially cortical dysplasia is, in a, is sort of an eradicable kind of you know, disease? Yeah, maybe it is, maybe it really is. Um, so I think it's at least just some kind of compelling way of, of thinking, about, uh, thinking about this very, very complicated problem. So I'm going to stop there. I want to acknowledge the members of my lab who've done all the work. These are some of my lab members here, uh, many of my collaborators who've helped me out, um, my recent funding from uh, National Institute of Health, and again, my, uh, really my eternal gratitude to CURE for helping us uh, get these studies off the ground and hopefully see them through to the end. So thanks very much. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. Peter, thank you for really superb talk. And my question has to do with timing of infection. So do we know whether or not HPV infection could um, cause a post-mitotic neuron to become a balloon cell? We don't know that. So that's one of the things that we're doing in the lab is to do in vitro infections with the pseudovirions in neuroprogenitor cells, fetal astrocytes, adult astrocytes, adult neurons. That would be the group I'd go for first. Because that could state the lesion, you know, when you find it, if it has Absolutely. to be during progenitor drug. 
Absolutely. And, you know, there's this other population of cells in the brain. Some of you may be familiar with this, but this is new to me. It's this population of cells called pericytes. Are you familiar with these cells? I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with this. But these really cool, they're sort of stem cell-like cells that hang out along the vasculature, and they do have tremendous capacity to differentiate into other uh, cell subtypes. The other thing that's neat is they're along the basement membrane, which would mechanistically fit in with HPV. You know, because it, maybe it's not this sort of classic view that it's coming into the early ventricle and it's hitting the you know, early ventric you know, ventricular zone. Maybe it's coming in along the vasculature and coming in through pericytes and going that way. So uh, I think there's a bunch of cells that we have to try this out. The first tour de force, though, is just showing that we can actually get virus into a neural cell. I think the data looks promising, but we're certainly not there yet. Certainly not there. Other questions? Yes. Well, the, the previous question was that you had both from surgical specimens and from necropsy or from autopsy. So all of the specimens that I've showed you here are from surgical resections. Uh, we have had a few uh, post-mortem samples that we've used, uh, but they have not been cortical dysplasia specimens. They have uh, been uh, from other causes, and we've used them as negative controls. And would it have to be from surgical specimens to have the, the um, enzyme assays or the, the assays available? Not at all. It would work absolutely fine. So you could do it in post-mortem tissue. You could do it in resected tissue. You could do it in fresh tissue that's taken directly from the operating room. This was all tissue that was taken, fixed, and then sectioned. So you're proposing that, and those kids have epilepsy, those adults have epilepsy. So the epilepsy that arises in those forms of cortical dysplasia, you're thinking, have a totally different etiology than in cortical dysplasia that have uh, So, yeah, so that's like a. Eighty gajillion dollar question, John. You know, and if you'll notice, I've st if I've stayed away from epilepsy completely because so I'm not sure how epilepsy excitability of cells is related to the actual pathology of any one of these lesions. I we all know anyone who does epilepsy work, we've all seen patients who've had really, really, especially in the pediatric population, kids with really, really bad epilepsy who have what looks like normal imaging on first pass, and then a small resection is taken, and they have these tiny little bottom of the sulcus dysplasias. So it's not clear that having a monstrous dysplasia is necessarily any worse than having a little tiny little dysplasia. In fact, most of the surgical series, uh, as I'm sure you know, patients do better with larger dysplasias that are radiographically visible than they are smaller dysplasias that you can't see on because they're probably just so tiny and they're just causing all kinds of problems. So I don't know if the epilepsy is different um, in this kind of dysplasia from others other than uh, John Gottman's group, the Canadian group, just published a nice paper in Brain where they looked at the EEG signatures of different types of pathologically defined dysplasias, and they are not the same. So the spike amplitudes, the frequency of spikes, the bursts, the types of ictal onset are very different in a type 1 teeny dysplasia from a type 2B big dysplasia. Whether the seizures are coming from the lesion or from the surrounding cortex is also an area of intense investigation. Some people, Carlos Cepeda, has suggested if you put electrodes into the lesion itself, balloon cells are pretty quiet, right? They don't do a whole lot. It's probably those ugly looking dysmorphic neurons that are really generating most of the, the burst. Anybody else? Oh, I'm sorry, in the back? Right, yeah. So, yeah, I'll just kind of moonwalk out of that question because that's, uh, that's a really tough question. Yeah. So well, I'll leave you with this point. So the answer is no. It's a very good question. We don't actually have the data to say yes or no to that. But I will leave you with this. In the, we have some work that we do with the Amish community in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So among the Amish community, because of their social cultural beliefs, the incidence of human papillomavirus is almost zero. It's basically nil. So we recently went through and we trolled the MRI reports from all of the patients that were seen with epilepsy at Lancaster General Hospital that are of Amish descent. There's not a single case of a transmantle focal cortical dysplasia that's ever been seen on MRI in any one of those kids. So that's like a poor guy's epidemiology, but it really does suggest that if we sort of mine deeply into this, we'll find that there's some kind of link between dysplasia. I've had, since I've published this paper, I've had six moms with 
kids with cortical dysplasia and intractable epilepsy email me and say, I had HPV, you know, a year and a half, two years before my son or daughter was born, and then they, they had intractable epilepsy and they have cortical dysplasia. And we actually have tissue from two of them now. So what we're going to try to do is get the E6 and E7 sequence from those brain lesions and see if we can track down the mom's pap smear assays and look at her HPV and see if the sequences align. That will really, I think, nail the, uh, put a nail in it. So, so it's a great question, but I don't have an answer to it just yet. Well, that's great. Let's thank Peter and Phil. Oh,